Oh, how you doing, folks? Um, I know it's been a couple of days since I've been on. I'm having trouble uh, personally with all sorts of things. Uh, not, money not being the least of which. And um, I'm trying to put it all together here. And it's very difficult. So um, that's not the only problem, but that's among them. Anyways, I uh, hope you're all okay. Uh, I'm not going to be doing the news right now. It's uh, Saturday night. And I don't think there's anything to really uh, talk about unless we want to rehash the balloon business and all that nonsense. So I figured what I would do is I would tell you about my thoughts right now on the conflict between um, Zapansky and uh, and Putin and uh, these two countries. Now, what I read today scared me because... I don't know. I don't think it's beneficial for Russia to lose tremendous amounts of men. I think it uh, would be beneficial for the world right now if Russia remained as a strong adversary to the corrupt people who want to take us into the land of anything goes sexually, the land of all this kind of terrible, terrible things that they're bringing us. And uh, Russia seems to be devoid of it, at least to a great part. The optics are not there for that. And to go a little bit further on that, I will tell you the latest that I've read. And I did happen to read this. I don't know if it was the New York Times. I forgot what it was, but it was a major uh, news outlet on the Internet. Um... It, sh- it said, and I read it today, that the, the Ukrainians are estimating that 17 Russian soldiers die for every one Ukrainian. And I must tell you something, folks. I think that's probably about right. Now, it depends on the, the strength Uh, that um, Russia has going in. Uh, When I say strength, I mean not only men, but manpower and also machines of different sorts that will uh, do the slogging for the men. And right now it's probably the men doing the slogging and the machines um, being of minimal help. That would be my guess. Uh, When you look back into Stalingrad uh, in World War II, Um, Much of it was hand grenade uh, warfare from around corners and through windows and around buildings and down streets. It was just horrendous. And that's exactly what we have here. The Russian soldiers are being put upon right now to take extraordinary body counts. That's my opinion. And I want to say something about that. What I want to say is my admiration for... I don't want to get maudlin about this, but the way things used to be. The United States at one time could do this, but it takes a country like Russia who holds and maintains their traditional values to be able to get in there and withstand, I think it's closer to 20 to 1. 20 dead Russians to one dead Ukrainian. That's my feeling on it. I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. Um, I saw some footage, uh, unrelated to this, but related in some way nonetheless, of a Ukrainian soldier jumping out of his trench and uh, watching a shell come in from fired from Russia uh, explode and uh, duck back in obviously before it exploded dunk, uh, dunk, d- um, dunked back into that trench and folks uh, you know there's an old saying uh, uh, clothes only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades well That's not exactly true with hand grenades when you dig a trench 
it becomes extremely difficult to kill your foe and your adversary when they go underground it, it, with very little to be able to shoot at them with. I did see something off, um, I think it was uh, Military Explained, that channel, and it showed that uh, the Russians are going in uh, right into these little tiny, virtually tiny <coughs> trenches. Some of them are small. And they're going in and liquidating the, Uk the Ukrainian troops that are there. Um, so, when you look at that, you begin to realize how incredibly difficult it's going to be uh, for them. And it appears that um, Zapansky or the uh, ministers of defense or whatever of Ukraine are not letting uh, Bakhmut go. They want to try to hold it at all costs. And it's understandable because I'm not an expert on this. I'm not an expert. But I will tell you what I saw on the map. And the map is a Ukrainian-leaning map, meaning that the information is probably fairly reliable. Now, what I saw about three days ago was um, th when you're looking at the map of Ukraine, um, just looking in, on the left side is Crimea and the uh, lower southern flank. And then you have uh, the higher up area and areas. And I don't know if that's uh, Kherson or Kherson. I don't know because I'm not familiar enough with it yet. But what it looks like to me, what I heard today, is that the Russians are um, putting tremendous pressure on the Ukrainians in five major areas is what I hear. Um, now, according to that map, which is pro-Ukrainian, the left side of the Ukraine, there is a bulge that is going westward, and it is starting, more than starting, to work its way up the left flank of the Ukrainian soldiers, which are in the middle of Ukraine, maybe 200 kilometers, 240 kilometers to the north. And the big danger of this for the Ukrainian soldiers is that if they get flanked, they're, they're done. They either have to surrender or they're going to be fighting to the death. So what you have is you have a left flank. The left flank is starting to go higher and higher and it won't take much to encircle the troops. And when I say encircle, you don't necessarily have to encircle the troops. Um, if you can be within close enough range to stop the uh, introduction of heavy weapons and, uh, and uh, replenishing of troops along major roadways, because that's about the only way they can do it. I don't think they're going to be able to do it over Tundra. Um, so I think it's going to have to be done through uh, highways. And right now, it looks to me like they're almost there. And I would say in another three to five days, they're going. They're, the Russians on the left flank are going to be close enough to harass anything that comes in from... The south. That's that's finished. It probably is now, because they're probably close enough to make wreak havoc. But on the northern side, um, that is the part that they don't have, and uh, the Russians need to gain some altitude there uh, to the west. Once that uh, Bakhmut is um, sealed in. It's over. And that could happen, I would say, within two to three weeks. It may even be a shorter time than that. It may be longer than that. It may be six, seven weeks. I doubt it will take that long because eventually they're going to be within shelling range of the highways. And uh, once the highways are harassed, the Ukrainian forces are harassed, um, 
it's going to be very difficult to resupply. Um, it's, it's just like it was in Stalingrad. This is just how it was. You had planes that were shot down when they were trying to get troops out from Stalingrad, uh, get uh, mittens and coats and things like that, food, ammunition. Planes were shot down. The German planes were shot down because it was that dangerous. They were taking that close a fire from all directions, the Germans were, in World War II. So, um, it's uh, that's what I see happening now in the Ukraine. And I think we're within, I'm going to say at the outset, at the very latest, we're looking at five weeks. It won't take any longer than that uh, to determine whether or not uh, Bakhmut is going to be sealed up, essentially sealed up, or whether uh, the Ukrainians can throw enough troops in there to bleed this 17 or 9. I think it could be as low as 6 or 7 to 1, but I doubt it. I doubt it, folks. This is even worse than World War II Stalingrad. This is the kind of thing where in World War I, where you had, well, it happened also in the Civil War. You had these pickets charge where you had very, uh, like just to give you an idea, okay? Um, you see that, that trash dumpster right there. Uh, can you imagine if your foe was behind that trash dumpster and all you had to do is get over it? or get around it, and it may be much, much wider than that, you would see that it would be extremely difficult. And in the Civil War, uh, you had Stonewall Jackson, uh, and I forgot what the rate was, but I think it was it was uh, 3 to 1, where they could withstand just slightly over, I think it was 3.2 to 1, where they could handle three times the amount of soldiers that were attacking as they had defenders, thanks to this these stone walls that they used to build, and other advantages to the defense. And uh, World War I uh, continued on with that, and some of the bloodiest battles in history were those World War I battles because the generals wanted to break through. And what you had is you it essentially had two forces, each one having a big... Uh, thing like that right there and they were in a trench how the hell do you do it you send as many men as you can over there and they get uh, pulverized the minute they get around or on top of that uh, dumpster they get pulverized they either get stabbed or they get shot or blown apart so I'm not saying all of them do but a great deal of them and that's what you had in World War One. and in fact just to let you know it was so bad that the fighting was so intense between these trenches that were sometimes from here um, to that fence right over there. It wasn't much more than uh, 80 yards, 100 yards, um, maybe less. And they couldn't advance because the troops would get wiped out in severe numbers and would have to either retreat or they would die trying. And that's where we're at with this conflict. And um, some of the bloodiest wars were in World War I. And um, because of that. And in fact, many troops were executed for cowardice. Because the, the, the bullets were coming in and doing all sorts of uh, pinging and ricocheting and everything when they were in the trenches and the men were told to charge and oftentimes the men would panic uh, when they got into there and I know some of the I know some French troops in World War one were were, uh, were uh, summarily shot uh, executed uh, for cowardice and um, it, it, World War one although I don't know a lot about it I know it was an absolutely horrendous affair and that's essentially what you have here. And um, if, um, if Russia doesn't take some air power, because I don't think tanks will do it. I saw what the tanks are doing, and, uh, and those, um, those tanks and those other uh, howitzers, uh, unless they're within a 
a five foot, six foot area, they just fall harmlessly to the ground uh, on the Ukraine side there. And uh, they're not doing any damage. So um, all it's doing is uh, causing the Ukrainians to hunker down. So it's good for that. But unless you get a direct on shot, um, you're not doing much with these tanks and howitzers. It's going to have to be air power. I've said it before that to me, the days of helicopter warfare are over. Helicopters are sitting ducks. You can talk to me about flares that they shoot out to protect themselves. Even the planes are having a hard time um, and getting shot down as well, particularly the Russian planes and particularly the Russian helicopters. The thing that I read this morning indicated one out of every eight helicopter, these KA-52 alligators, <coughs> and the other one, the 26 or 25 Sokov, uh, whatever it is, they're suffering horrendous losses. Uh, they were trying to go in, exploring into the area behind the front lines, and that had to be stopped, according to what I read today. And it looks like um, the military powers in Russia have determined that they're going to use a combination of two helicopters in order to be able to stay near the front lines, probably not going past the front lines, and um, protecting each other because some have better um, uh, radar systems and some have better um, de um, uh, defense mechanisms for these uh, anti-aircraft weapons. Because right now, in 2023, um, helicopters, in my opinion, are sitting ducks. That's just my opinion. And uh, tanks are the same way. It's going to require uh, these. I know that they have a name for them. I know the American military has them. They're these little dune buggy. Uh, they're the little dune buggy tanks um, that are nothing more than dune buggies, essentially. I forgot the name of those. Um, but uh, that's going to be the future of tank warfare because... Um, you're just not going to be able to stay in a 70-ton vehicle or a 35-ton vehicle because the weapons are so terrible right now that that's what's being done to them. And I don't see any way out of it. So that's what we have and that's what's going on. And uh, that's my thoughts on this conflict. Um, no matter, I still think that Russia is going to break through and take Bakhmut, and when they do, it's going to uh, wipe out all the supply lines into that whole area there, and um, Russia's just going to start having their way more and more, I believe, until NATO decides whether or not they want to send in NATO troops, which I think is inevitable, because that's what they're squaring us away for. I don't think the United States troops will go in there per se. I think it will come to limited mushrooms in that, and um, they'll solve it one way or another, which I'm not looking forward to. That's my guess. I had misjudged that. I thought the United States was going to send in um, uh, soldiers, but I don't think there's any need for that that the U.S. military uh, views. I think that they're going to use limited mushrooms, and um, um, th they'll find a way to blame it on others would be my guess. Uh, although I don't know that to be a fact. That's only my guess. Anyways, folks, take care. That's my 15 minutes with you, and I hope you uh, got something from this. And I will be back with you tomorrow. Bye.